<laughs> Hello, welcome to Sketchyville. So this video is going to be a little bit different than my normal video. Normally when I record a voiceover for a video, I'm working off of a loose script. But today I decided to wing it. I am substituting this video for my normal midweek blog post. So I'm going to try and be a little bit more conversational and hopefully I'll walk you through my process a little bit more than I usually do. Before we get too far into this, be sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell so that you get notifications every time we post a new video. I've been working on a diorama about a book series called The Dresden Files and I needed a chair to go into this diorama. The scale of this project is an inch scale or 112, which roughly translates to every foot in the real world is an inch in miniature. So I laid the items that I was going to be using or thought I would need to make the chair out on the table. I am using a bit of scrap balsa that I have left over, some plastic cocktail forks, some fancy toothpicks, and some wooden spoons. And I will provide links to all of my materials in the description box or in the blog post that this goes live in as I normally do. Now, I'm not going to leave this as a teaser. The scale of this project goes horribly wrong, but that's okay. At any given time, I have at least three projects going. One of them is in inch scale. One of them is in half scale, which is 124, or for every foot in real life, it's a half an inch in miniature. And one of them is quarter scale. So while I was intending for this chair to be for my inch scale diorama, I noticed about halfway through that it was much smaller than that. This is part of the reason why I have multiple projects going on because then I can shift gears and say, okay, it's not gonna work for my big project. I can use it for one of my smaller ones. So the first thing I did was measure out the size of the seat of the chair onto a piece of balsa. Now, if you've never worked with balsa before, it's super easy to cut with a craft knife, which is why a lot of miniaturists use this wood. So I measured out the seat of the chair to be, I believe it was about an inch and a quarter, inch and an eighth. If I had gone into my dining room and actually measured a chair, this project might have been a little bit more in scale than it ended up being, but I was winging it. I do that. I don't know why. I end up disappointing myself half the time, but it's okay. Just roll with it. Now, you'll notice that I am angling the piece that I'm cutting out because if you look at a chair in your house they're a little narrower towards the back than they are towards the front where your knees hit the chair so I made it a little bit smaller in back to get that angle once I cut the piece out I then sanded all the edges and rounded the corners a little bit now you'll notice as I'm sanding the seat of my chair I am not using sandpaper I have sandpaper I do use it sometimes but I'm a nail tech I know how to use a nail file so I use acrylic files those are the ones that are a little padded in the center for a lot of my miniature making they're just really handy to have and they last a really long time so I find that they are the perfect tool for the job in most cases. This next technique is one that I talked about in one of my very first blog posts. I'm using a sanding band on my Dremel to file an ass groove into a chair. Now, you know what an ass groove is, right? 
I hope I don't have to explain it to you, but just in case, it is the part of the chair that conforms to your butt when you sit in it. So now, you don't have to do this. You don't have to put ass grooves into the chairs that you make. However, if you have kitchen chairs that aren't padded, they probably have that ass groove in it. Manufacturers make them that way because it makes them more comfortable. So to keep my miniatures looking more realistic, I file it in. It's not hard to do. I just use sanding bands to get the initial shape where the legs go. And then I use a grinding stone to kind of fill in the part where your butt actually rests. I don't use a sanding band to do that anymore. I used to, but I stopped because the sanding bands kind of tend to leave a harsh line that becomes a little bit more difficult to sand out. So the grinding stone is just a little bit more of a gentle way to get that engraving into the wood. Then once I've taken down the bulk of the material with my Dremel, I just use, I think it's 180 grit sandpaper to smooth it out and take down any ridges that were left behind. In all of these types of chairs that I've made before this one, to make the back, I typically use popsicle sticks that I bent using boiling water or steam. And then I was watching YouTube one day because that's what I do in my spare time. I have no life anymore. So I either make things or I'm watching YouTube videos. So I was watching YouTube and the miniaturist that I was watching pulled out a wooden spoon and used that to make the back of her chair. And I thought, wow, that is so much easier than the way I've been doing it. And I would totally link that video if I could remember who it was. I am so sorry. So if you are the person who originated this idea, let me know because I would love to credit you. Most of my ideas are not my own. I tend to take other people's things and modify them to work for me. So it's not that I'm trying to steal your idea. I just don't remember who you are to credit you. I'm so, so sorry. But anyway, so I immediately ran out and bought a pack of these wooden spoons off of Amazon. And there are two different kinds. And I think this might be part of where my scale for this project went terribly wrong because I got the small ones because I thought the squared top would work really good for a chair. And when they came in, I thought, gosh, these look kind of small. And it turns out, yes, they are. They are kind of small. But to make the back of my chair, I just cut the handle part of the spoon off and kind of figured out where I wanted the seat of my chair to go. And I marked that off with a pencil. I used the Dremel again because I am a lazy crafter and I have arthritis in my hand. So any way I can make things easier works better for me. So I used the Dremel to remove the bulk of the wood up until that line. And then I used my nail file to file it the rest of the way and smooth it out. And then I rounded all of the corners on the top of that spoon to make my seat back. I had cut the seat of the chair in a straight line on the back piece and the wooden spoon that I'm using for the back of the chair has the concave, convex, rounded, it's rounded, it's rounded a little bit. So I needed to fit 
my seat into the curve of the back of the chair. So to do that, I just kind of held the back of the chair next to the seat and scribed a line so I knew how much of a curve I needed to file in. And then I just filed off that excess until the seat fit snugly against the back of the chair. I wasn't really sure when I started this chair what I was going to use to make the legs. So I just kind of grabbed some things in my stash, the carved toothpicks, these plastic appetizer forks. In here you can see I'm kind of holding them up to the seat of my chair and what I'm doing is I'm checking the scale. So the toothpicks were way too skinny to be chair legs, even in this smaller scale that I'm working in. The handles of the plastic appetizer forks were too big. They were way too chunky. So what I decided would work the best are the tines of the forks, the stabby bits. I measured those a little over an inch, maybe an inch and an eighth, and just cut them off. They're plastic, they're really easy to cut. I use my easy cutter. Uh, you could do it with an X-Acto knife. Once I had the seat of the chair sanded so that it would fit against the back of the chair, I went ahead and glued those two pieces together. I used a fast acting glue so that it would grab and take hold and not fall apart on me. And I used Fabri-Tac for this, but the problem with doing that is I'm gluing wood and Fabri-Tac is not meant for wood. It's meant for fabric. It's literally in the name. But wood glue takes a while to actually grab and I didn't want to sit there holding onto these pieces for forever. So to get around that, I used Fabri-Tac first and then once it had taken hold, I went back with wood glue and filled in that seam. So that kind of gives you the best of both worlds. You get the fast acting grab from the Fabri-Tac, but long term, it's not gonna hold the wood together. So by adding wood glue later, I'm using the properties of the wood glue to keep those two pieces together long term. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me, so <laughs> who cares? Once the glue had dried on the chair, I went ahead and glued on the legs. Now, originally I had intended to paint the chair first. It's just a lot easier, especially if you want to keep the legs looking like the shiny metal that they are. But, and this often happens to me, I got so excited about how it was coming together that I really wanted to see how it looked and my plan just went out of my head and I glued the legs on. I got like two of them on there and thought, crap, now I'm gonna have to paint around these tiny little things. But it wasn't a huge deal. It's just so much easier if you don't have to do that detail painting. So if you're making one of these chairs, you might wanna paint it or stain it before you actually glue the legs on. Now, same as with gluing the back and the seat of the chair, I wanted a quick grab glue to start with, especially for the legs because they just want to flop all over the place. So I used super glue to get them on there. And once they had taken hold, I went back with wood glue and just added a bead of glue around the top of the legs to give them that long-term hold that I'm looking for. So here's the point, and yes, it really did take me that long, when I realized that this chair was tiny. And here it is next to one of my inch scale chairs. 
right? Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. But I realized that it is almost perfectly half the size of an inch scale chair, which makes it perfect for my in half inch scale project that I'm working on. And coincidentally, my half scale project is a mid-century modern house. So the shape of this chair is absolutely perfect. So I'm just gonna call it serendipity. So now knowing that it is going in my mid-century modern house, which is not going to be abandoned and totally distressed, I decided to go with that really sleek lacquered wood that was really common in the 60s and 70s. So I base painted the chair black. Actually, I didn't even base paint it black. I painted the chair black just a nice dark coat of black. No distressing, no aging, nothing. Just a clean coat of black over all the wood and left the legs of the chair that nice silver from the plastic forks. Once the black paint was dry, to complete that look of that lacquered wood, I gave it two coats of triple thick gloss. Now here's the thing about triple thick gloss sealer. It is an amazing product. I love it. It comes in the worst packaging for it on the planet. I have been struggling because the lid keeps getting glued to the container. So recently I switched it into a smaller squeezy bottle that I can keep on my desk and basically a shampoo bottle that I cleaned out and then labeled that it's triple thick gloss. This way when I open and close the container it's not getting stuck on the threads and sealing itself shut when I put it away. So the packaging is unconventional, but it is still triple thick gloss sealer. Trust me. Well, you have no reason to trust me, but why would I lie? One of the reasons I really like the triple thick is that you can paint it on super thick with a brush and while it's drying, the brush strokes just kind of disappear. It just melds into itself and you are left with this super shiny, gorgeous finish. And here is my finished chair. This was really a super easy project. Probably the hardest thing is filing in those ass grooves and it turned out fantastic. I love it. Now I'm going to show you it again next to one of my inch scale chairs. As you can see, it's really tiny and it's not what I was intending when I started the project, but it actually worked out pretty cool. So that is it for my new informal blog type video. If it works, maybe I'll do them more often instead of actually writing my blog post. As always, if you like this video, leave us a thumbs up. It really helps our channel out. And you know what? Leave us a comment too. We want to hear from you. Have you ever messed up a scale project so badly that it turned into a completely different scale? Let us know your experiences and tell us what you like about our videos or what you don't like. We want to know. And if you didn't like this video, go ahead, give us a thumbs down. Joke's on you. That helps us out too. Thanks for visiting Sketchy though. We'll see you again real soon. <laughs>